Amen. <clears throat> now at this time, let's look at the book of Colossians. Colossians chapter 3, in verse 11. Today we are looking at Colossians chapter 3, and we are reading verse 11. Let us all rise as we read the word of God together. This is the word of the Lord. Here, there is no, not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. This is God's word. And may God bless you with his word. These days, uh, one of the words that we are very focused on, I think, is the word identity. I think a lot of people are confused about their identity, and they're trying to find it. Um, but when we try to find our identity, it seems as if the world tells us that our identity can only be found in a way that makes us different from others. We are not satisfied in having our identity as just humans, that we are all people, that we are all creatures made in the image of God. No, instead, when we look at the way the world tries to identify us, we find that there are many lines that can be drawn. Race, social standing, culture, political views, gender. Sadly, these identities do not unite us together in helping us to know who is with us or who is for us. Rather, the sad thing is, when we find these identities, we end up finding instead who is against us. And this is where it seems that we are coming into an identity crisis because our identities are dividing us and our identities are alienating one from another, brother from sister, father from wife and child. We're all becoming, in, in our identities, isolated. And it seems to be an identity crisis. <clears throat> now, the question that we are often trying to figure out is, who are we? Right? Isn't this a question that we are trying to find out when we are looking for our identity? Who are we? What is the most important to you? What is it, what is it that defines you? And the thing about this, and when we are looking for identity, is what we are striving for is this word called authenticity. We want to be true to ourselves. And we want others to be respectful of that truth of who we are. Now in Colossians chapter 3, verse 11, the Apostle Paul addresses this issue. Because the Apostle Paul is addressing how our earthly identity should not divide us. You see, there were different reasons even then why people would be divided. The first group here we see is of the Greek and Jew. It's not the Jew and Gentile, but it is the Greek and the Jew. It was the Jews who sought after signs and the Greeks who demanded for wisdom, for knowledge. But you see, these were racial lines or national lines that were uh, things that made them proud. They were proud of their heritage. They were proud to be Greek, to be of the center of learning and of philosophy. 
And they were proud to be Jews, to be the people who received the law and the promises of God. But the Apostle Paul is saying here, there is not Greek and Jew. In other words, we are not meant to be divided by these national lines, by these racial lines, by these things that would divide us. Another category that the Apostle Paul goes over is circumcised and uncircumcised. Now this could be for a legal standing or a ceremonial standing, and it shows for those who would be a true Jew. If you wanted to be a true follower of God, if you wanted to be devoted to God, you needed his mark, his sign, his seal. And this sign and seal in the Old Testament was simple. It was the mark of circumcision. For the New Testament believer, it is the mark of Baptism. It is the mark that you have received in the receiving of the Holy Spirit. Now, sadly, I think that these days, you know, I hear a lot of you know, random things, but we are not meant to get confused with these signs and seals. You know, we hear things where people are saying, oh, if you get a vaccine from the, you know, for the coronavirus, it's the mark of the beast. It's the mark of the devil. No, that is not a sign and seal. The sign and seal in the Old Testament for the people of God was circumcision. And in the New Testament, the sign and seal for God's people is the Holy Spirit. That when you are baptized with the Holy Spirit, no one can take that away from you. Nothing can undo this. Even if someone were to force you and to pin you down and to give you this vaccine against your will, that will not drive the Holy Spirit from you. Because you have been sealed by the Spirit of God. Now that's a side tangent, but what Paul is talking about here is that there is no circumcised or uncircumcised. That is not what defines you. That is not the core of who you are anymore. It's a radical statement. The next group may not seem to be so obvious for us, but at that time, a barbarian was someone that the Greeks would make fun of who are non-Greeks. You know how we have different ways that we make fun of different ethnicities and you make fun of different uh, languages and accents? I'm not going to imitate any now, but the word barbarian is actually based off of that. When the Greeks would make fun of the way other people speak, they would, it would sound like bar, 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 bar. And so they would make fun of them as the barbarians. Right? And that's where the word came from. Bar, 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 barbarians. That's where it came from. It was to be of a person who is low in culture. Someone who is an uneducated, cultural sloth. Well, what about a Scythian? Scythians were even worse than barbarians, supposedly. There was a quote that was um, kept about Scythians by this, this one person named Josephus writes about Scythians in this way. He says they are a little bit better than wild beasts. So if you were to think about an evolutionary scale, they're basically just becoming erect, according to Josephus. 
you have the barbarians who are the lowest of the low, and then you have the Scythians, and the Scythians were basically savages. That's what they thought. It was of a cultural lowness. It was of a cultural ignorance. They were uncultured. Now, in this earth, we often feel this way about others. We think about people and we look down on other people because of their views or because of what they think. Well, the Apostle Paul says, there are no barbarians. There are no Scythians. Because in Jesus Christ, that person to you can be your brother. That person can be your fellow servant. Someone who is a fellow worshiper of God. And in the church, these lines cannot divide us. Now this last group here of slaves and free, for us it seems, you know, we don't seem to have slavery in our modern uh, context and where we are. Sadly, our country had been plagued with slavery, but it was a bit different from the slavery at that time. You see, slavery was basically a way that the poor people or the poorest of the poor would be able to find work. You could imagine approximately one-third of Colossae would have been slaves. To be a slave was to be a day worker. It was to be a worker, but uh, you were obviously treated not as a person. Aristotle would have written that a slave is a living tool, basically. And a tool is just an inanimate slave. It's a slave that doesn't move. A slave was basically a tool. But Paul writes here, he's saying here there is none of this. What is this here? This is where we see the new creation the new self, the person who is being made according to the image of God cannot see these earthly divisions anymore because the gospel must shatter these barriers. The gospel must tear down what divides us. These earthly identities are not what is important. It's not what is most significant about who we are. Now, the Apostle Paul, he describes this in, in similar ways in other places. That this breaking down of barriers happens. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13, the Apostle Paul writes, For in one spirit... We were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. Now, if you notice, the list is shorter. Jews, Greeks, slaves or free. But the point is slightly different. The reason why there are no differences between the Jews or Greeks, is because we have one spirit and we are baptized into one body. The emphasis here, it would be what we would describe as our understanding of the spirit and in pneumatology, in the way we know the Holy Spirit, that we are united together in one spirit and in one body, we cannot be divided. Another place would be in Galatians chapter 3, verse 28. There, Paul writes, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, 
There is no male or female, for you are all one in Christ. Now, if you notice, again, the list is different. Jews or Greeks is the same as what we've seen so far. Slaves or free, that's what we've seen so far. But he adds, there's no gender. There's no male or female. And he's not saying that, okay, we're all without these earthly identities. It's not like these are all fundamentally erased. That's, that's not what Paul writes about in the rest of his writings or what we see in the New Testament. But the emphasis here is our identity. Our earthly identities in Galatians chapter 3 is now erased in this sense because it is transformed in the newness that we find in our union with Jesus Christ. This is an healthy ecclesiology and understanding of the church. That if you understand what it means that we are all one, then you would understand we cannot be separated. We cannot be isolated or divided. We cannot have these different class structures within the church. Now, in, Galat in Colossians, here we see something that is radical, radically different. 1 Corinthians talks about pneumatology. Galatians chapter 3 talks about our ecclesiology. But in Colossians chapter 3 verse 11, Paul says, Why is it that there is no Greek, Jew, circumcised, uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave-free? The main point that Paul is writing here is that Christ is all. Christ is all and in all. Paul here is emphasizing the lordship of Jesus Christ. That Jesus Christ is the Lord of all. And because he is Lord of all, he reigns. And so we cannot be divided because he has his authority over everything. How can we divide what God has brought together? How can we divide what God was pleased to reconcile in Christ all things together? Colossians chapter 1. It was through Christ, through Him. It was in Him to reconcile to Himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of His cross. Verse 22. He has now reconciled in His body of flesh by His death in order to present you holy and blameless. You see, the church cannot be divided because Jesus is the Lord of all. He is the Redeemer. He is the Savior. And He unites all things together, whether on heaven, on earth, all things are now touched by His peace. You see, what we are looking at here is not just a simple change in our identity just because we make a few minor adjustments to our personality. Right? It's not just about just switching some sins for some good things. Okay, so I need to stop this and do this less, and I need to do this more. It's not some kind of rehabilitation in that sense where you are just fixing yourself. 
What Paul is writing about here in Colossians chapter 3 is a new creation. It is a radical change and transformation because of the gospel. It is where a sinner has been transformed into a saint. And the core of our identity, the core of who we are must be that Jesus Christ is our Lord. That we were sinners. And that without Jesus Christ, we would have died. That if Jesus Christ did not come into our lives, if he did not look on us in mercy, we would have been utterly lost. In order to save us, Jesus Christ had to identify himself with us. Jesus Christ would come into this world and he would become true man. The son of God would become the son of man. And he would stand in our place. And he would be identified with us as sinners. And that when Jesus Christ died on a cross, it was for us. It was for our sins. It was for my sins. You see, the core of our identity must now be that we are crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live. It is Christ who lives. It's not me, but it is Christ who now lives in me. This is now who we are. This is supposed to identify who we are. Now the problem is, if you do not see this of yourself, if you do not think of your core identity as Christ, if you do not see yourself in your core identity as a sinner who needs a savior, then you need to ask yourself, who is Jesus to you? What is more important than Jesus if it's not this? Is Jesus just someone who helps you with your homework? Is Jesus just someone who helps you with your business or your career? Is Jesus just someone who helps you so that he could just make your life a little bit more comfortable, a little bit better? No, this cannot be. Our identity must now be in Christ. That all of my life was affected by sin. That there was nothing about me that was okay. But everything was infected, everything was sick. And that We needed Jesus to save all of us. Not just a part of me, not just a few of my sins, but my whole life. And when we understand this, we should realize this is not just about me, but this is for all who believe in Jesus. And this is where we would see that if, if we realize this, if we really understood just how 
radical the gospel is, just how powerful the gospel is to shatter our barriers and to shatter the power of sin over us, then we would be able to say like the Apostle Paul, the love of Christ controls us because we have concluded this, that one has died for all. Therefore, all have died. And he died for all that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for their sake. Him who is for their sake, he died and was raised. And from now on, Therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. No more of these earthly identities, of these earthly lines that are drawn, these earthly standings, social standings, cultural, political lines. Because even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Now what this means is that within the church, all fighting should stop. All judging and arguing and animosity should stop. We should now look at one another and realize this is my brother. That an enemy can now become a fellow brother or sister in this heavenly family. And that we would have this new heavenly perspective where the cross of Jesus Christ defines all of us. Does the cross define you? It's because Christ died for you. And that is what is most significant. That is your ultimate identity. And if Jesus Christ died for you, then it is no longer for yourself that you should live, for your own gain. But your cause, your purpose, should be for the glory of the Lord. You see, now, if we fail to understand this, Paul is basically telling us it is because we have a faulty Christology. We have a faulty understanding of the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Because, you see, Jesus is Lord of all. And so may the love of Christ compel you. May the love of Christ compel you to love one another. Let us pray. Do you recognize that you are a sinner and that Jesus Christ died for you? This must be the most important thing that has ever happened in your life. This is now what identifies who you are before God and before everyone else. It should be what transforms how you see yourself. It should be what transforms how you see this world. You see, the world tries to obtain peace in these earthly identities, and it's trying to remove our identities in such a way, but the sad thing is, it will utterly fail. It can never succeed. 
Because the end result of this world's unity, this secular unity, can never be that Jesus is all and in all. And if Jesus is not all and in all, it must fail. It cannot succeed. But if you live your life and understand the Lordship of Christ, you would recognize it in a simple statement. Jesus is all. Jesus is all and in all. And so I challenge you. What does it mean that Jesus is your Lord? Let us pray about this.